the talk I'm going to tell you, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, this material, this project that uh, uh, we started uh, just a few months ago with colleagues here at, North, at, uh, at Methodist, uh, where uh, we're looking at developing new materials to deliver uh, RNA. Uh, we started, I started long ago with just uh, small interference RNA, and then when I talked with uh, Yvonne, uh, last year, actually, uh, the summer before last, uh, about delivering larger RNAs, uh, we didn't know if it was going to work, so we gave it a try. We moved to microRNAs, and now we're moving to even larger RNAs uh, for uh, other applications. So uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the dream team, uh, Andrea, uh, Enrique, and Carlo, uh, Carlo is a member of my group, and all of you know Enrique and Andrea. Of course, Yvonne, Haifa, and the other guy at the end, that's myself, I'm just the messenger here. I'm gonna deliver, or at least I'll try to deliver the message that I was uh, entrusted with. Uh, so, as uh, most of you know here, uh, atherosclerosis is uh, an inflammatory uh, disease, it's a chronic inflammatory disease uh, of the arteries. So you have the endothelium cells that line up the walls of the vessels that uh, when, when there is uh, uh, accumulation of uh, LDLs that cross this uh, endothelial uh, cell wall, uh, they undergo oxidation. Uh, that oxidation uh, signals to monocytes in the bloodstream to cross the membrane to uh, uh, remove them. And so they turn into macrophages once they are in this uh, medium here. Uh, this process goes on to form this uh, foam cells and the foam cells accumulate. Uh, some of this uh, accumulation turns uh, necrotic and that leads to further inflammation. This process here is uh, uh, controlled by a number of uh, uh, mediators, uh, inflammatory signals, but also in particular these microRNAs, uh, microRNA 125A and 125B. Um, and so uh, it's a complex process uh, that I just starting to understand actually, uh, because I'm coming from a totally different uh, planet, so to speak. Uh, compared to what's uh, going on uh, in, in this uh, process here. And, um, and so our challenge was to uh, design uh, a, uh, a microRNA that can reach its target inside the cell. And that microRNA that uh, uh, Yvonne has designed is shown here. It's a chimeric uh, structure uh, of uh, uh, a sequence here, mask RNA, uh, which is the uh, MALAT1-associated small cytoplasmic RNA. This portion here actually guides the RNA or uh, this precursor to the microRNA to the right location in the cytoplasm once it gets inside the cell to be processed. And once it is processed, it releases the microRNA, 125A or 125B or whatever RNA you want, uh, so that it can exert the function that uh, we want it to uh, uh, want it to exert. So uh, the problem with uh, with uh, delivering RNAs is that uh, systemic delivery uh, and cellular uptake uh, by cells is quite limited. Uh, the technology appeared many uh, years ago, in fact. And uh, it go, you can trace it back to gene therapy uh, from the uh, 80s and 90s. And the problem is the delivery. Uh, there's, uh, they have to evade the immune system. Uh, they have to survive all the nucleases. And they have also to cross the membranes of the cells that they are targeting. Uh, two negatively charged species are not going to like each other. And so the uptake is not always an easy uh, handshake. Uh, here we have, uh, again, uh, once it, assuming we have passed this hurdle uh, and it makes it inside the cell uh, and into the endosomes, 
it has to be released from the endosomes. Uh, and, and so that's another hurdle that there are a number of ways you can uh, promote that process once uh, we cross uh, you know, the, the membrane, cell membrane uh, hurdle. So that's another challenge. And then uh, once it gets inside the cell and it is released from endosome, it has to go to the right location uh, in the cytoplasm so that it can exert the function that we want. And so all of these challenges call for making materials, new materials, that can uh, deliver and address all these uh, issues that you see here. And the material that I'm going to tell you about is the rosette nanotubes. Um, and um, I'll tell you first about their chemistry very, very briefly, how they're made or what they're made of. And uh, we can uh, move on to, uh, to, the other, to the applications and the result that we have obtained. So they're inspired from nature. Uh, they are derived from guanine and cytosine. Uh, these are the natural bases that make up DNA. What we have done is we replaced this imidazole group in guanine by cytosine. So we end up with a different base, a non-natural base. So there's no equivalent to this base in nature. It expresses the G hydrogen bonds and the C hydrogen bonds on the same molecule in a very specific arrangement. And we can modify this synthetically. So all of this is done synthetically. We can modify this further by inserting additional rings between the G and the C phase. And that has some consequences on the properties of, uh, of the molecule and the subsequent assembly process that takes place. So when this molecule is placed in water under the appropriate thermodynamic uh, conditions, uh, it undergoes spontaneous self-assembly. This is actually a solid state X-ray structure, single crystal X-ray structure, that shows the 18 hydrogen bonds. So there's three here, three here, three here, and so on. So there's 18 hydrogen bonds maintaining this structure together through those GC hydrogen bonds that we're so familiar with. Uh, uh, from, from the DNA double helix. And this is how it comes together. And we have established this uh, using uh, advanced solid state NMR studies. We published this just uh, a couple months ago uh, where we have replaced this nitrogen with uh, N15. Uh, it's a, actually an undertaking that took us, well, about 10 years or so. And a whole bunch of people over generations of students and postdoc to really establish the network of hydrogen bond and unequivocally convince the community that this is actually the structure that we have. Um, and when it self-assembles, it forms this stack. So those little rings come one on top of the other and it forms a tubular structure uh, with an inner channel of one nanometer, 10 angstroms, a core structure of three nanometers, and then, depending on what you attach to that GC base, you can have larger diameter. So in this case, we have lysine amino acid, and so the outer diameter comes up to three and a half. This is a, a molecular dynamic simulation just to show you the self-assembly process. Uh, so we do uh, a modeling. So we first, uh, so you can see the GC bases here. Uh, we can place them in a solvent box. So this is a, actually a box filled with uh, water molecules. I'm not showing the water molecules here, just so that you can focus on only on the self-assembly modules. And you can simulate an environment where the take uh, where the self-assembly takes place. So this is a about a hundred nanosecond simulation, uh, which is an extremely long time period when you think about multi-scale modeling. Uh, when you're doing uh, experiments in a flask, uh, generally this assembly can take minutes to sometimes hours. But we believe, and the community believes, that uh, 100, what happens during that 100 nanosecond could be a good representation of what happens in, uh, in, real, uh, uh, in a real experiment. And in fact, uh, that the molecular dynamic simulations and ab initial calculations have been rewarded with a Nobel Prize just uh, a few years ago uh, uh, for, you know, for all that they have allowed uh, scientists like myself to do. 
When they have assembled, they form this, uh, this long uh, threads that you see here. Each one of these lines here corresponds to a tube, and they can also aggregate depending on the concentration. And this is a close-up view of those nanotubes. You can see that uh, each one of these lines here is exactly the same size as its neighbor, and that's about three and a half years. So this is the one functional functionalized with lysine amino acid on its, uh, on, on its surface. So we made a whole bunch of different nanotubes. Uh, remember what I told you? We have a, a GC base. We can have a tricyclic and even a tetracyclic system. And depending on what you attach what to the lysine amino acid, you can assemble a tube with different inner diameters. So here it's 1.7 nanometers, so 17 angstroms. Uh, in, in principle, we should be able to encapsulate single-stranded RNA or DNA inside the channel in this case. Uh, we can add one more ring here, and we can take it to a double-stranded DNA. Um, and here we have a functionalized nanotubes in the interior, so we can start encapsulating hydrophobic drugs, drugs that are not soluble in uh, aqueous environments or that are highly toxic, so we can encapsulate them and deliver them to the right place. And uh, we can also control the stability of the system by uh, you know, using just synthetic chemistry. Uh, I'm not going to get into the, those details. So uh, we looked at, this is where molecular dynamic simulation is important and, and modeling is important. Uh, it allows you actually to predict the stability of a drug inside the channel. So in this case, we looked at ferrocene as a model and uh, we looked at different nanotubes and we looked at the energy. So this is the, actually the potential mean force in kilocalories per mole. Basically, it's the association energy. And as the molecule goes inside the channel, it has each time it hits a disk, the energy <coughs> goes up and then goes down. And so, so there is a barrier for movement in the channel, but once it is inside, it's very hard for it to come out, okay, unless the tube disassembles. And it does, ultimately. And that's a mechanism that we use to deliver a, a small molecule drug. And so, Depending on the size of the tube, you can see that the barriers are different. It's high barrier, low barrier, medium barrier. And so we have different tubes with different barriers. Here, this is an example for dexamethasone, an anti-inflammatory uh, drug, also anti-cancer drug, uh, where, where it is encapsulated into four different nanotubes. And we find here that K1, the one that has lysine amino acid and one nanometer inner diameter, has the highest stability. So do we want higher stability? Do we want lower stability? It depends on the application that we want. And we can scan literally thousands of drugs in a in, in, in few hours. So in this case, we took 7,000 drugs from the drug bank, and we can determine their stability for each one against each one of these nanotubes. Um, and then we can select the appropriate nanotube for the delivery. So now we can combine small molecule with RNA, and that will, now I would like to switch back to the RNA delivery. And for that, we design nanotubes where we can control the charge density on the surface. So when the tube is formed, as shown here from the parent molecule that forms a rosette, and then the rosette stacks form the tube, these chains here are expressed on the outside of the tube. So the number of lysine amino acids that are outside will determine the charge on the outside of the nanotube. And that's perfectly controllable. Furthermore, we can also add function to these nanotubes. We can add RGD peptides that bind to integrin receptors. And we know that endothelial cells has, uh, have uh, uh, expressed large numbers of those receptors. And so if we want to target endothelium, for example, we can use these particular nanotubes that we know are going to go very easily inside those cells. So this is, and we can control the density of this RGD peptides on the surface of the tube because density also plays an immense role in uh, the ability of the cell to take uh, a, you know, a, a peptide or a, a molecule or a, a anything from the uh, exterior. So this TEM, I want to show you this now because uh, just to give you an idea about how this, 
how RNA and these nanotubes look. Um, and so these are the nanotubes that I, that I showed you in the previous slide earlier. So you can see the, they are, you know, they, are, they form these linear structures, worm-like structures. And then when you add RNA to them, they change their morphology. And what you see here is you see a whole bunch of dots and little aggregates uh, that are distributed over the entire TEM grid. And when you zoom in on those structures, what do you see? These are actually nanotubes that are standing up on the surface of a grid. So each one of these dots, these white dots here, correspond to a single nanotube. And each one of these single nanotubes is standing up, and the RNA is trapped in between them. So the nanotubes are positively charged, RNA is negatively charged, and it acts as a glue to hold them together. All right? So keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that the height of a nanotube goes in increments of 3.5 or 3.4 angstroms, just like DNA. Okay? And so the length of this aggregate is going to be proportional to the length of the RNAs that they are binding. And it's, it's remarkably true because when we did the, the uh, uh, titration, it turns out that we need about 400 equivalent of the molecules that make up these nanotubes to capture one siRNA, one RNA, one microRNA. And when you do the math, that's about 70 to 80 base pairs in terms of height, which, which is pretty close to what we're playing with uh, uh, so far. So um, let me go back now to this uh, slide here and uh, remind you of the microRNA that uh, has been fabricated. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm going to tell you now about the studies that have been done. So some of the work that was done by Andrea um, uh, from uh, Methodist, from here, uh, is to, and this is from the RNA core, uh, amazing uh, quality uh, RNAs, uh, RNA uh, materials that you can see here. So from single-strand DNA oligomer with a T7 promoter, can they form a double-stranded DNA template, which is then uh, transcribed into microRNA and purified. And you can see here the different types of RNAs that have been produced. We have the 69 base pair uh, malat mask RNA, micro R125B, 90 base pairs, 159 base pairs for this scrambled one, 90 base pairs for uh, this one, and 88 for this one. The ones that we have tested in our experiments are about 250 base pairs. That's, that's correct, Andrea, right? So the, those microRNAs that we have used, uh, first we tested them to see uh, if they have any cytotoxic effect on the macrophages. And remember from this slide, the culprit is this fellow here, the macrophage. Once the monocyte cross this barrier, they turn to macrophages and start eating up those oxidized LDLs. So this, uh, it turns out that macrophages are not affected by the nanotubes alone. Uh, they are just happy up to 100 micromolar. This is a nanotube with one lysine amino acid, and this one has three lysines, so it's tripeptide uh, of lysine attached per base, per GC base. So the charge density on this particular nanotube is much significantly higher than this one. And this is DMSO, just as a control, positive control. On this uh, experiment here, on this slide, what you see is, the, uh, is actually the quantification of uh, the amount needed to capture uh, the, uh, the RNAs, the microRNAs. And we can see that as we increase the ratio, uh, so this is the number of molecules that make up the tube, 10, 100 to 400, okay? You can see at 400, there's no more free RNA, pretty much, relative to zero to one. And uh, what you see here, if you count 400 and divided by six, which is the number of molecules in a disk in a rosette, you end up with about 70. And 70, that's the length of the tube, okay? And the length of the tube is essentially 
uh, in base pairs, pretty much, except that these are hexamers. And so, in a sense, the length of a 400 molecule equivalent of rosette nanotubes is about the height of a 70 to 80 uh, oligomer of RNA. So once the tubes reach the size that is approximately the size of the RNA, they uh, reach a maximum uh, level of capture of that RNA. Then we looked at the stabili stability of these RNAs uh, in uh, fetal bovine, uh, bovine uh, serum, and we found that uh, after uh, extended exposures, several hours, microRNAs are stabilized relative to the free, uh, free RNA, as you can see here. So they can impart stability. They protect the RNAs from nucleases. In uh, this experiment, um, we looked at the delivery of those RNAs. These RNAs have been uh, labeled with the Alexa F546. This is a green uh, fluorophore attached to that we that was attached here to the siRNAs, to the RNAs, but, pardon me, microRNAs, and we looked at their. Uh, we measured the fluorescence using a flow cytometry method, um, and what you can see here is a control versus the um, the microRNA alone versus microRNA with lipofectamine. Uh, Consider the gold standard for nucleic acid delivery. And this is our nanotubes, which compare very well to this system. We did the adv added advantage that it is non-toxic. Um, then we looked at the viability um, for, in the case of uh, this cell, um, human umbilical vein uh, cells. Uh, and so what we see here, the control in presence of lipofectamine and in presence of RNTs and RNAs, the cells look just fine. And you can see that also the viability is nearly 100%. We also did a uh, confocal microscopy uh, imaging. Um, so we have different systems here. It's the same palette as in the previous slide. So you have the control, lipofectamine alone lipofectamine plus microRNA, mask microRNA, and RNTs with mask microRNA. And uh, here in green is uh, the cytoskeleton that has been uh, 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 labeled with this green fluorescent probe. DAPI is the blue probe for the nucleus. And in red uh, is perhaps not, the contrast in the room is not uh, uh, sufficient perhaps to see that there's red color coming from the RNA that made it inside the cell. And you can compare this result to the lipofectamine. In the case of lipofectamine, there's barely any red fluorescence there. And then this is just a, a, an overlay of those images. And if you look even closely, you can see that, uh, well, uh, the red uh, RNA, the mask RNA, actually made it inside the cell and it is close to the nucleus. Uh, as you can see here. So, um, so now we, we can deliver microRNA inside the cell, but can we release it? Can we, can actually, does it have a function inside the cell? So the last experiment is to see if, if we deliver microRNA, is it gonna have this, uh, this positive effect or an effect uh, either an ateroprotective or aterogenic effect uh, once it makes it inside, uh, inside those cells, those uh, macrophages. And this is uh, an experiment that uh, Carlo has done recently with uh, where he took uh, untreated cells, macrophages, he treated them with, light, with the, uh, the nanotubes. He uh, treated them also with microRNA-125A at 125B, and uh, I was told, uh, Yvonne told me that this actually makes sense because uh, 125B is known to induce 
inflammation. And the inflammation here is measured by measuring the NO release in the supernatant. So as the uh, macrophages are exposed or as they uptake the microRNAs, uh, they, uh, they are activated and that leads to a sequence of uh, biochemical processes leading to a release of NO in uh, the supernatant. And the NO can be measured using this grease uh, assay. And so this makes sense. This is in agreement with what's known. And this is the new, uh, which was somewhat unexpected result. Uh, it was desired, uh, but still unexpected. So this, this is with K1 and microRNA. Uh, you can see that the amount of NO expressed relative to the, to the microRNA alone is about more than 10 times more, uh, higher. And in the case of 125B, uh, it's more than double the amount of you know, that has been released. So there is some function. There's still a lot of work to be done in terms of control experiments and whatnot. And we're going to get to that uh, in the near future. So I'm almost done. In summary, we have, uh, I believe, successfully generated unique microRNA complexes with mask RNA domain. The RNTs are not toxic for this uh, family of cells, this murine uh, macrophages at various concentrations. We have also optimized, and we can optimize the conditions depending on the length of the RNA. In this case, it turns out that the 400 to 1 is the ideal ratio. MicroRNAs encapsulated by RNTs remain intact uh, in, uh, in the presence of nucleases. Uh, the internalized RNTs, uh, microRNA complexes show great fluorescence relative to the control. Uh, they are non-toxic for cells, such as UVEC. Uh, they are uh, also uh, have improved internalization in the presence of RNTs, the microRNAs. And finally, the RNT delivered microRNAs are processed with macrophages within macrophages and exert their uh, intended fun function. Uh, so, what's next? Uh, we need to assess the effect of these RNAs on macrophage from cell formation. Uh, in particular, we need to know. Uh, what sort of uh, inflammatory or pro-inflammatory markers are being produced. So that's something we're going to do, get done as soon as I get back uh, to, to Boston. And um, we need to test RNT microRNA complexes in vivo, um, uh, specifically assessing delivery efficacy and functionality by analyzing bioavailability, by distribution, and toxicity in vivo. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.